Uh, the central idea of my work is that the rhythms of music and the rhythms of biology can reach each other and become commensurable through movement. And when this happens, a musical pattern can become a guide or an aid to a pattern of behavior or an action, enabling someone to do something that they were unable to do before. Now, I've pursued this question in three distinct phases. This is an old shot of myself as concert pianist. Now, a couple of years before this shot, if you had told me that movement would lie at the center of my path, I would have been very unhappy with you. Norman Seif expressed his discomfort knowing his life was going to go through emotion. And for me, my body was something that only caused me problems. I had Tourette syndrome as a child. My ability to regulate my temperature is so weak that I bundle up every night. But in fact, as I struggled to gain mastery of the piano, I realized that a study of movement, an investigation of it, had to lie in the center of where I was going. That led a few years down the road to the development of my own form of movement therapy with music, which I called cognitive eurythmics. And here's me teaching some children in a eurythmics environment. And this also is a picture of me. More recently, I've moved into neuromuscular imaging in the hopes of quantifying some of the amazing effects that many of us have seen in our music and movement studios. The first picture is an anatomy scan of a slice through my thigh. Now, Hanley talked about how we are water, and nowhere is that more true than MR imaging, where the status of the water molecules in your tissue determines all the contrast. The other two pictures are elastograms, so you can see in one, I'm activating the muscles on top to lift my leg at the knee. In the other, I'm activating the muscles underneath to press down. And it turns out that every person, their activation patterns like this are as unique as their thumbprint. And we're hoping we can use this to target and track therapies. This all starts for me about 15 years ago. I was a couple years out of music school. I was in the midst of two movement certifications. And I was teaching at several suburban music schools, piano and general music. And at those schools, mothers often come in with special needs children to see if any musicians there will work with them. And musicians are an open-minded lot, so frequently we would. And I had many such students. Now, early on, one student presented with attention deficit disorder and had great difficulty processing the world around him. And we were working on a simple early lesson on the subject of beat, the simplest of all musical subjects, you might say. And I asked him, how many beats is this? And he said, three. And I asked him, how many beats is this? And he said, four. And then I asked him, how many beats is this? And he said three. Or other days he might say four. He would say whatever answer worked for him last. And it really, the, the coolness and the easiness with which he made such a guess exposed to me just how much of his life he spent using things that had worked before to navigate a world he couldn't fully take in. Now there's a time-tested psychological description of what was happening. In 1956, psychologist George Miller wrote a well-known paper called The Magic Number Seven. And the basic idea behind it is that we can hold about seven independent pieces of information in our awareness at any time, and any more than that, and our ability to retain is overrun. That's why when we give people phone numbers, we break the digits up into groups of two, three, and four. Because even for an ordinary person with a simple phone number, if it's given all in one shot, it's very hard to retain. So how do we make order of the world around us? Well, we group things and we create hierarchies out of what's coming in, and we recognize things that are coming in with categories we already have to keep it manageable. So I thought one description of this boy's ailment, his disability, was that he couldn't chunk. And I thought to myself, it could be that the most basic way that we use chunking in music could help him. I was struck by a simple act of making a musical beat with a ball creates an incredibly clear and pure signal and perhaps I could use this to probe his disability, the way that engineers use simple harmonic vibrations to capture the properties of materials. And I found with many such students that I worked with that when you have a game of rhythmic movement, when there's an object in simple rhythmic motion, whether it's a ball or whether it's somebody's body, that it takes the amorphous condition of an internal deficit and turns it into something concrete that the child can see and feel and play with. And children are so responsive 
that as soon as that starts to happen, the self-correction begins. So you might say I was helping children with deficits, but you might also say I was creating an environment of music and movement that allowed them to play with their own deficit. And when that happened, self-correction and deep change always took hold. So with this boy, I took the most basic unit of musical chunking, and that would be our natural ability to group beats into twos, threes, and fours, what's called meter or measure. And we would play games that involved chunked beats. One, two, three, measures in three, and so forth. And as he got the feeling of how to do that, he could invoke that feeling when I bounced the ball monotonically. One. Two. And then he could add the arithmetic back in and keep that feeling of chunking in his body. One, two, three, four, five, six. And after just a few lessons, he could hold his focus and count to 20 and beyond. This was a strategy that was similar to what I used for many students. We would create an environment of music and movement that enabled the behavior the child needed. Then we would strategize about how they could re-invoke that sensation at school or at home in order to get the behavior that was necessary for them to prosper in the situation. I went out into the schools and after-school programs and therapy centers and taught this kind of work. Sometimes I was wearing the hat of music teacher, sometimes dance teacher, sometimes I was an inclusion or special ed teacher or a therapist. Sometimes I used music and movement to work on behavior like in that story. Other times, I used children's natural behavior and instincts to help them learn more about music. But no matter what I taught them, it seemed like it all came down to the same central axis, which is the execution of and the synchronization with rhythmic patterns it seemed to be a great aid to learning and to change. Now this map maps out the locations that I taught in 10 years in New York City. And if you know anything about New York, you will know that some of these neighborhoods provided me with well-to-do, well-nurtured, well-nourished kids, and other neighborhoods substantially less so. There was a whole spectrum. And I want to bring up two schools by way of contrast. One was a school that was a magnet school for musically gifted young children. It tested them for exceptional ability at age four. It accepted 15 applicants out of 500 including many, many applicants whose parents spent a lot of money on tutors so that they might score higher on this test of native musical ability. <laughs> I simultaneously taught at a school in the East Bronx, which had not, not even remotely comparable resources inside or out, except one angel foundation that paid for the youngest children to have a 20-minute dance class a week. Now, during the first year when I taught at these and a whole spectrum of other schools, if I, when I look at my curricula for, say, age six, and I look at how far they got with rhythmic patterns and the sophistication and the understanding, needless to say, the music magnet school is on top. And the first year in the East Bronx was very challenging. I suppose I would put it on the bottom. But the second year, something very interesting happened. It's true, the music school was still on top. But the Bronx kids picked up on the teaching that I had had the previous year, picked up on the teaching like we had just stopped the day before. And they started to pull ahead of all the other schools, so that at the end of the year, they were a strong second, far ahead of many schools with many more resources for the musical and otherwise. Now, I was really fascinated by this, and I thought a lot about what would create this extraordinary result. And my thought about it is as follows. The, the, the Bronx school had a very strong language barrier. And I think when children are underserved by society, there are more broadly speaking barriers that are not their fault, that are doing this to them. These experiences of rhythm, the basic sense of a beat, of dividing a beat into twos and threes, of grouping beats into groups of twos and threes, these are among the most fundamental human experiences. We feel them with all of ourselves and in all domains. And since we know that the brain communicates with itself through rhythm, you might even say these are the fundamental units with which the brain does its work. And whether you're working with a child with a learning disability or a developmental disability or any other kind of barrier, or a senior who's lost the ability to function, or anybody else with whom you'd like to develop behavior and see change, if you come riding in on a wave of rhythmization, you can often knock down a lot of those barriers. 
Now, I taught this method after a four-year Feldenkrais method training and a four-year Dalcroze method training. So I was working fairly intuitively off of eight years of training, and when people would ask me how they could do it too, I would say, just train for eight years and you'll see it's easy. <laughs> But somehow nobody ever did that. So what I've done over the last couple years was try to boil down what I did into a set of four basic principles that anyone can follow to rhythmicize a learning experience with a student. Number one, movement leads music. Start with the behavior, watch the child's behavior, and follow it. And even if you're the world's worst musician, just get a hand drum and just try to find a little bit of music that you think captures the feeling of the child's movement. You'll find that children find this very interesting. Number two, flip the game. Music leads movement. You and the student have created an experience together of music and behavior. Now you lead with your instrument and see if you can play together that way. Rule number three, flip that game. So whereas before the teacher provided the music and the student provided the behavior, now it will be the other way around. Hand the instrument to the student or have them get one of their own, and now you do the behavior and have the student follow you and try to make music for you. And then for the fourth corner of this chart, the student makes the music and you have to do the behavior however they play it, which is another game children tend to find very intriguing. <laughs> now you just keep flipping these four squares together And you'll see three things happen over time. There's no particular order you need to do those corners. Just flip them in a the way that's fun for you and the student. You'll see over time, the, the student's behaviors will proceed from reaction to prediction to modulation. At first, the behavior is a challenge. That's why you're working on it. There are many internal faculties that need to synchronize. The child needs to work on getting things together in the right way. And you'll see things out of sync. And you'll see lag. And you'll see that they react to elements in pattern and music. But over time, that will change. And that's when you get to the prediction. So that you'll see a preparatory phase to their movement emerge. And you'll see that they begin to synchronize with you and anticipate what you're doing. And that's a sign that they've mastered the behavior in context of that music. And then you can proceed to the modulation. <clears throat> and the modulation is where you get most of the learning transfer and the development. You can take your music slow and fast, loud and soft, or if you're on the behavior end, you can do the behaviors that way. Tell emotions with what you're doing. Tell stories with it. And over time, what you can do is take the behavior and spread it out and stretch it until the child's able to function, at least in that music movement environment, in the way that they're going to need to. And those are my four basic principles for how to rhythmicize an activity. And I believe we have a little bit of time for a brief demonstration. Please come sit in a circle. Come sit in a circle. Um, maybe we'll sit around this dot. Um, that, that might take us a little close to the edge. So, but we'll start this way. That's, fun. That's great. And then we're all just going to scoot in this direction one time. And you, you most importantly, because you're near the edge. Thank you. And you too. <laughs> and, and one more time. You sit on the dot. We'll do it, and you can sit on the dot a little bit, and that'll get us close to a circle, I think. Can, can you come in more? Come over to this part of the dot. More, 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 more. There you go. If you're ready, show me this. If you're ready, show me this. If you're ready, show me this. Show me straight arms, crossed arms, straight legs, crossed legs. someone who will take a walk around this circle for me. Please, thank you. <laughs> take your own walk. <laughs> who 
will join him. Everybody up, please. This way, around me. Good. Who will play? Would you like to play? No, no, no. Would you like to play? <laughs> Thank you. One more player. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, we're not done, we're not done. <laughs> Can you take a walk like this? Go ahead, anywhere you like. Exactly. Thank you. Take a bow. <laughs>